fellow bookworms to Tibra's Den. My name is Whitney and today we are going to be talking about the Kiss Quotient by Helen Huang. This is one that has been on booktube fairly often um, and when I see people talking about this they never well there's been okay there's been a handful of booktubers who do at least mention it but most of the booktubers I see who absolutely love this book and everything they fail to talk about the key part of the book which is Stella is autistic um and so obviously I'm autistic so I thought I would go ahead and break this book down kind of walk you through the important parts of Stella's journey as an autistic woman. Um, I think, you know, it's a shame. Like, obviously, if you're not familiar with autism and whatnot, I don't expect you to fully go into it. But most people haven't even mentioned that Stella's autistic. And it's written by an autistic author. Helen Hong is also autistic. So, very much a shame. But today, I'm here to remedy that. And we're going to break it down for you. There's also some discussion questions in the back of the book that I'm going to present to you guys. And you can kind of ponder and definitely let me know your thoughts in the, the comments down below because I would love to hear them. But of course, before we get into this, if you could go ahead and give this video a like, it really does help out the channel. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification so you don't miss out on a thing. So, the kiss quotient. This one follows Stella and basically, you know, she comes up with algorithms to predict customer purchases, um, but, you know, she's 30 now or, and her parents want grandbabies and she really struggles in the dating department. So she decides that she's going to hire Michael to teach her, you know, how to kiss and how to do more than that. Um, and then how to be in a relationship and such. So that's kind of the premise of the book is Michael is an, an escort and him and Stella, like, they're obviously, you know, he's teaching her. But in the meantime, they're developing feelings it is obviously a romance. So um, that plays a key part. But I'm just going to walk you through. I marked, you can see I marked several pages. I actually ran out of the yellow and I was reading in bed. Um, so I was like sticking little tissues into each page uh, until I could come, you know, today and, and mark the rest of them. But there's so many moments and I've heard really good reviews on this book, but they, the reviews are just like, oh, it's such a fun romance. And there's, you know, lots of steamy scenes and it's just like this quirky, fun romance. And it hit me a lot different. Like the first pages, like it brought tears to my eyes because I could relate to Stella's struggles so much. Um, and I thought I was actually going to have to put it down at one point. But it was just so good that I didn't want to put it down. I read it. I started about five in the evening and stayed up until two. So I read it in one sitting. Um, but yeah, really, really good book. Really good story. There's some things, you know, that were a little bit romance heavy that I didn't like so much, but still overall really, really enjoyed the book. So the first page I marked um, was page two. So right off the bat, I was really relating to Stella and her struggles and such. So she's having, I think it's lunch maybe with her parents and her mom brings up the fact that she's ready for grandchildren. Um, and so it says, you're 30, Stella, dear. We're concerned that you're still single. Have you tried Tinder? And I just really related to that because I remember my mom and my sister pushing me so much to date and to get out there and to give men a chance and such. And it was like, I'll do that when I'm ready. Like, I'm not ready now. I don't enjoy dating. Like, it's a struggle. Like, and my sister would always be like, you have to kiss some frogs before you get to your prince and my mom was like you don't give men you know enough of a chance like give them more of a chance but to me if I you know interacted with them and there was something I knew I didn't like why would I continue to force myself through that just to give them more of a chance you know 
Um, to me, I wasn't going to be just casually dating or anything like that. If I was going to date, it was going to be to find a life partner and such. Um, and so I really related to that, you know, that family pressure and such um, to try to, to get you to, to put yourself out there. Uh, and then the next one I marked is the next page, which is page three. And her mom basically put her hand on Stella's and just had her hand on Stella's. And it's, she says, uninvited touches irritated her and her mother knew it. She did it to acclimate her. Mostly it drove Stella crazy. And that was another part that I really related to because... I hate hugs, and my mom would always, you know, force hugs upon me, you know, and I just, I hated it, and I would have to tolerate it and such, um, and so it wasn't until, you know, I got a little older, and I was like, no, like, I don't like them, like, don't hug me, um, but she would, you know, just like, oh, I just love it on you, you know, and I don't know, I always felt, like, smothered, and I still don't particularly like hugs, but... Um, I can tolerate them a little bit better depending on the situation, but yeah, she would always do that. <laughs> I would, I can only tolerate it so long and be like, okay, now get off of me. Um, and I do the same thing with my husband still today, so. Uh, and then this next one is page 55, the beginning of chapter 7, and she said she didn't know how to be semi-interested in something. She was either indifferent or or obsessed, and that's definitely me, like, if I don't have interest in it, like, I'm just kind of like, whatever, but when I have interest in something, I become obsessed, uh, key in point, if you've seen my most recent, um, well, not my most recent video, but, a uh, recent video where I talked about my Nora Roberts books and such, like, when I'm obsessed about something, I'm obsessed about it, otherwise, it is kind of just like, eh, um, there's no middle ground for me at all. So really, really related to that. And a lot of autistic, um, people can relate to that as well. Uh, so I definitely, definitely enjoyed that one. Next up we have page 77. And so they're out getting ice cream. And I really love this whole little date that they had because when my husband and I first started dating, we would go to the movies and then there was a little ice cream place right next door. So we would always get ice cream and that's how we always started dating. And she gets mint chocolate chip. Um, and <laughs> so he's like, I, I, that's my favorite too, but I'll get something else so you can try something new. Or we can try something new. And she's like, what do you mean we? <laughs> um, and so he's like, you don't want to share with me? Um, and she's like, no, that's not it. Not entirely. Um, but the fact was she made a detailed analysis of ice cream flavors. And she si decided this one was the best in existence. I just know what I like. Uh, and I really related to that one. I liked the whole ice cream scene because it reminded me of my husband and I when we first started dating. But two, I'm like that, like, I will try new things, but only if, like, if I go to a buffet or something. But if I'm going, like, if we're eating out at, at like, a restaurant, and I'll normally get the same thing over and over again because I know I like that. And I'm afraid if I try something else and I don't like it, I'm going to be disappointed. So I might as well just get what I know I like enjoy it. I'm not quite as bad as like analyzing all the ice cream flavors and such like that. Um, that's a quirk specific to Stella, but, um, uh, yeah, just that whole scene, you know, brought nostalgia and I could relate because I'm like, you nope, know, and I normally get mint chocolate chip. Mint chocolate chip is by far my favorite. Um, so if I don't know what to get, that's my go-to, though I will I'm not quite as strict as Stella because sometimes I just want something a little bit different. So, of course, now my lactose intolerance has gotten so bad I really can't eat ice cream anyway, which is makes me sad. <laughs> then the next page is page 91. And she... Basically, they're in this club. Like, she tries 
Michael decides, you know, to, to take her out on a date um, so she can get the whole experience and then go to this club because he doesn't know she's autistic. And so she gets overstimulated and she has to leave. Um, and she mentions that she could withhold the truth, but she never learned how to lie. And I really relate to that because at this point, Michael's cousin is there and he's, you know, figuring it out. Um, and so, yeah, she's, she could never learn how to lie and I'm horrible at lying. Um, I, I can't do it. I don't understand why people, I mean, I do in some instances like little white lies, you know, you're trying to surprise somebody or not hurt their feelings or something, but overall I just don't see the point in lying and I'm really bad at it anyway. Like I, I just, I can't. I can't lie. Um, so I really related to, to that one. Um, and then the next page is page 94 and she's always tapping. Um, and she's playing uh, a piano. Like she's playing a song, like she's on the piano. And I do that. Like I've never played a piano. I'm not musical in that sense, but I do really enjoy like listening to music. It helps calm me down and if I'm really stressed, I will, I will like play or if there's a song, you know, I'll kind of playing, I'll kind of play like I'm playing along to it, even though I'm not musical in that sense. Like Stella is like, she's played the piano and she has that background. I do find it comforting and it's kind of a way that I, I stem too. So, um, really related to that. And that's just a stem and you can stem because you're nervous and you're kind of getting rid of that energy or because you're happy and you need to get rid of that energy. It just kind of helps regulate you. Um, which, you know, is, is a big thing <laughs> that autistic people do for sure. So, um, let's see here. So in this page, it's page 99, and she's talking about how new things are scary for her, but with him, she can handle them and even enjoy them. And I really liked that page because it, the right person really does allow you to get out of your comfort zone. And I've seen that in the past with friends of mine who kind of they just have the right personality to allow me to experience new things. And my husband's like that. Like, he really knows how to kind of talk me through something new and really help me get through it. So that was another thing that I really connected with because it it's hard for us to connect with certain people and try new things. But when we have that right person, we're able to do it on a certain level. So that was another another point that I really connected to and now we're on page 106 and so in this scene Michael's talking to Quan who is his cousin that you know helps sell out at the cold club fiasco and he learned you know that she was autistic because she couldn't lie and now we have him kind of trying to point Michael in the right direction without um, betraying Stella's confidence, I guess. And so they're, his brother, so Michael's other cousin, is autistic. And so he's like, have you ever thought she's kind of like Kai? And Michael smiles slightly. Yeah, just a little though. Stella was on the social, socially awkward side like Kai, but she was far more expressive and sensitive. And that just really hit home for me because a lot of women haven't gotten their diagnosis until later in life um, because autism doesn't present the same way in women that it does in men and or boys or whatever. And so, um, you know, there's kind of that stereotype that this is what autism looks like. Um, and so, yeah, so Michael didn't make that connection because it presents differently. Like, yeah, there's similarities there, but it presents very differently in Kai than it does in Stella. So I did want to point that one out as well. Then we're on to page 109. Um, so this one 
her kind of like housekeeper lady calls in because her son's sick. And so she's like, you'll have to take the dry cleaning though. Like it needs to go. And since I won't be there, you'll have to do that. And so Stella's debating whether not to take the dry cleaning because she doesn't even know which dry cleaner to go to or anything like that. Or whether to take it because then she'll have the wrong number of skirts if she doesn't. And so she's like, which which one is going to stress me out more, essentially? And I do that all the time. Like, I'm always like, okay, like, which is the lesser of the two evils? Like, which one is going to cause me more anxiety in the long run? And I'll do the one that's going to cause me less anxiety, essentially. And so, um, yeah, it was going to be less anxious for her to take her stuff to the dry cleaning than it was to have the wrong number of skirts. So she ended up kind of sucking it up and, and taking her stuff. Um, which, it just was like, that's, that's so me. Like, I could relate to that so much. Um, and then the next one, she's meeting Michael's family. And so, she's first Googling, you know, is it appropriate to take gifts? What kind of gifts for Vietnamese family and such? And then she spent, towards that end, she spent the day devising conversation trees in her head so she can minimize the need for social improvising, which often ended badly for her. And that's actually a key part of, like, often getting your diagnosis and such is social conversations and such. And so many of us do. We create scripts. Um, and we do scripts that we kind of lay out if we're going to have to socially interact with people. Um, and so that way... We, it's not so scary, it's not so unknown, um, and we'll have something to say, we won't have to think of it on the spur of the moment, which often fails to work out anyway, because you can't predict what other people are going to say or do, um, but we definitely try our hardest, and I know I certainly do, I'm always having big old long conversations, and then I, I go further though, I don't always devise just a conversation tree, I try to add variables, so okay, if they respond this way to something, like, then how will I respond? Um, and so, yeah, it's definitely something that autistic people do. We create whole conversations in our head, trying to add in any unknown variable that there might be in the conversation. So, um, and then on this next page, 125, she's meeting the family. And I just added this one because this is where I kind of differ from Stella. So she worked up a smile and a wave, bracing herself for an evening of nerve-wracking social performance. She approached them and asked, can I help? And so she's helping, you know, with the cooking and such, which when my husband and I first started dating and I was first meeting his family and such, that was a huge source of stress for me because in my family, we don't want help. So whoever's in the kitchen, they're doing their thing and everybody else just stay out. Where I noticed with his family, everybody kind of gets involved. And so I would be so stressed out because it's like, do I offer to help? But then what if they say yes and I don't know what to do? I don't know how they like to do their stuff or anything like that. Like I don't know their specific routine because obviously not like my family's routine. And it used to stress me out so much so I wouldn't offer to help at all. And I would just be like, I'm just going to sit here. And then I'd be stressed out because I wasn't offering to help. But it's like, again, what's the lesser of the two evils? Not offering to help and being stressed because I think that's rude. Or offering to help but run the risk that they actually want help. And then I won't know what to do and I'll panic. Um, and so, yeah, that was where I differed a little bit. Like, she offered help and she kind of jumped right in, you know, on multiple occasions. As far as, like, helping with cooking or the dishes or whatever. And I'm like, I'm not like that. I'm like, nope. I'm just going to sit in my spot and hope I'm invisible. Uh, so, just, you know, again, there's a saying, if you met one autistic person, you've met one autistic person. Because we're all still individuals, you know. We're not, we all still have different personalities, different likes, and things like that. Um... And so then the next is page 140, and this is where Michael's starting to kind of figure it out, and he's comparing Stella and Kai. 
um, and kind of where their similarities are as far as, you know, maybe being autistic. Like, at this point, he's not for sure she is, but he's starting to figure it out. Um, and so he's just talking about how he never really noticed when he, um, Kai never noticed when he tripped up on sensitive conversations, conversation topics either. He was horribly honest, creative in strange ways, and, you know, just da-da-da. And so that's when he kind of figures it out. So, and then page 145. So this is in between. So he's, she's met his parent or his mom and his family. It didn't go very well. And so now she's going back, but she, because of all the stress and whatnot, like she's basically in autistic burnout. And so this is like where you see that vulnerability and she tells him, I can't handle the TV tonight. She confessed in a pain whisper, but he now has figured it out. And so he can understand that, um, and whatnot. And she goes on to say she despised it when people had to make changes for her. And I really struggle with that too. Like I want to fit in. So I put myself in uncomfortable situations and I allow myself to be uncomfortable so other people don't have to change and make accommodations for me. And that's definitely something I'm working on. Like, I'm trying to be better about that. But it is still a struggle because I don't want other people to be uncomfortable either. Um, and have to walk on eggshells and do things differently just because it's causing me pain. And causing me, you know, to have to recover in a more extreme manner later on, if that makes sense. So, um, let's see here. And so at this point, he's kind of observing Stella, you know, to see those signs that he kind of missed initially. And he didn't mo notice so much when it was just the two of them. But she had trouble with eye contact. She rarely spoke unless someone asked her a direct question. And then her answers were short and to the point. When she listened, however, her focus was the kind of stuff she probably used on complex economic problems. Um, and I really related to the being silent and, you know waiting for somebody to address you and not just jumping in and joining in on conversations um because I do struggle with that for sure um I'll I'll be silent over jumping in any day <laughs> because I don't know when's appropriate to jump in and everything like that and I just overthink it so um let's see here and then the next is when they're kind of finally because it has been a slow burn. I mean, there's definitely steamy scenes. But now we're on page 167. And so we're about, you know, halfway through the book. And we're finally kind of getting to where Stella's comfortable enough with Michael to kind of go further. Um, but I just wanted to point out this one part. I'm not going to go into detail, obviously. But it says her body was in a state of shock from the sensations barding, bombarding her bombarding her um and it starts with this was too new and I could really relate that to that as well um that was definitely a, sh a struggle for me was kind of the the sensations of everything and um just the newness and trying to figure it out but then you have all these sensations so it's kind of like sensory overload as well um so I just wanted to kind of point that out and then the next one is page 182, and she's working. And so her phone buzzes, and the screen read Dinner with Michael. So she sets alarms for herself, which I kind of do in a sense. Like, I put stuff in my calendar and always make sure I have a reminder. And she glanced at the computer monitors again, but she knew better than to basically touch her keyboard because there was no such things as five more minutes for her. If she went back to work, the next time she surfaced from the data would be well after min midnight, and that's why she set the alarms. And that's pretty common as well, um, especially if it's something that's a special interest of us. Ours, we do become hyper-focused, and like that's the only thing that exists, um, which I just went through that recently with getting my Nora Roberts collection complete and creating that video and such. I was so hyper-focused on that as special interest of mine that nothing else existed outside of that um 
And so, like, the first day I was kind of organizing everything and whatnot and didn't eat. And then the next day I was videoing and editing and such, didn't eat because that was all that existed for me. Uh, and so that's a very real thing that happens. And we also struggle, like, sh you know, she'll kind of remind herself to eat and stuff because we struggle with in interoception, uh, interoception. Um, and so we struggle knowing like what our body's telling us often. And so that's another big thing that a lot of autistic people do struggle with. So, um, alarms are friends. <laughs> and then next, you know, they're kind of having a personal moment, like an emotional moment as she's crying, um, which is related to something else, but she really can't tell him. But she was saying she didn't know how to communicate what she was feeling. Her chest was bursting with emotion. It was too much, too intense. And that's another thing I think is a really big struggle with a lot of autistic people is we have the emotions and such, but we don't know how to express them. Um, so it could get very, very overwhelming because uh, we just we don't know how to express it and it just kind of builds up. Um, and so that's, that is definitely a struggle for us as well. And let's see, next we're on to each page, uh, 226. And again, it's kind of addressing the whole lying thing. And so she said she wasn't good at lying, but she knew how to pretend she was okay. She'd been doing it around people since she was little, which is masking. Um, and that's one, another reason a lot of women don't get their diagnosis until later because we do tend to mask a lot more than m autistic men um because you know we're, we're trying to pretend we're okay and it goes back to kind of the a gender stigma you know that women are emotional and whatnot and so we're not trying to be like that and so we mask more um and so that's like a clear example that you just you pretend you're okay it's not like, we struggle with lying, but we mask and pretend, um, which isn't the same. So, and next we're on page 248. And so, this is kind of, she's having to go to this event that her parents have. Um, and she's, like, he's asking her if he's, she's okay with the noises and such. Um, and she's like, I'm more nervous about the seating arrangement. My mom always likes to put me around new people. I've gotten better at the talking, but still a lot of work. He tilted his head as he absorbed that part. For him, talking was talking. Uh, there wasn't a work part. You overthink it. I have to think really hard when I talk. Otherwise, I blurt out rude things and alienate everyone. Um... And so then it's, it's, he's going on, it's because you're honest. People don't like honest, except for when you're good, saying good things. Figuring out what people think is good is tricky, especially when I don't know them. It makes conversation a minefield. And that is, I mean, a classic example of the struggle to socialize and how much work and how exhausting it is. Because you really have to think. And people, well, you're just overthinking it. Like, just relax. It's not as simple as that, you know, because if we don't overthink it, then we put our foot in our mouth and we say the wrong thing um, and we're rude and such. So if we don't overthink it, then it can be disastrous, too. Um, so we overthink and we try to be appropriate and such, but then we're exhausted. Um, and my husband's always telling me, like, you're just overthinking it. I'm like, no, you don't understand. And so I really related to that whole little conversation because, like I said, my husband was definitely kind of will do that too. Like, you're just overthinking. Like, just relax and just do it. Um, and not fully understanding. So, and let's see here. So now we're on page 264. And she's talking about, she says, Michael was mint chocolate chip for her. She could try other flavor, flavors, but he'd always be her favorite. Um, and her mom's, you know, I don't want to give anything away on this part, um, spoil anything, but it's basically, you know, she's saying, like, I know what I like and such. And so, like, why would 
I can try other things, but I'm always going to come back to this one, you know? And I, again, really related to that. It's like, it's, you know, you know what you like and you're not going to go outside that comfort zone. Um, so, and then next, so I am going to have to spoil a little bit in order to keep talking about it. So if you don't want to, you know, learn the struggle, definitely maybe skip ahead to closer to the end when I do the discussion questions, um, or feel free to hop off now. This, I know this video is getting longer, um, but basically going to spoil ter spoiler territory now, but basically, you know, obviously it was more of a business arrangement and there's kind of mixed feelings there. They both want to be together, but Michael kind of thinks that he's not good enough for Stella and Stella then thinks that he is just taking pity on her and doesn't want to be with her because she's autistic and the autism is the reason why he doesn't want to be with her. Um, and so they basically break up at this point and he says, he leaves her a note and says, I accepted your proposal because I wanted to help you. And she's you know, upset by that because it's not because he wanted to be with her, not even for money, but because he pitied her because she was autistic. Um, and I never went through kind of that, that feeling. When I got my autism diagnosis, it was a very good thing. But with Stella, we see her struggling over and over and over again, thinking, you know, trying to hide her diagnosis, thinking it was a bad thing. And I never experienced that. For me, it answered so many questions and it was a good thing because now I had answers. Um, I wasn't struggling, you know, in the dark anymore. Um, I had answers and I can kind of make accommodations for myself that I didn't know I needed. And so I didn't really have that struggle. And I never felt pitied by the people around me. Like they were happy because I was happier now and I had answers and such. Um, and so, you know, that was a difference. But I know... A lot of women, especially, kind of get dismissed. Um, and so I know, you know, that it's not always a positive thing when they get their diagnosis because people, oh, you're not autistic, you don't look autistic, or, you know, you don't act like these autistic boys, or whatever the case may be. Um, but for Stella, you know, she felt like she wasn't enough. And I do relate to that, like that I'm not enough. Um, and if I didn't have these issues, maybe I would be. Um, I do relate to that, even though, like I said, the people in my life have overall been really supportive and such. So um, the doubts do like to creep in sometimes. And so now we're on to page 268. And at this point, she's feeling frustrated and she's kind of mad because other women could do these things. And so she decides she's going to start wearing perfume and she's not going to worry about the seams on her clothes and such. Um, and so she basically makes herself uncomfortable just so she could be more like other women. Uh, and she's comparing herself to other women. And I could definitely, again, relate to that because it is tiring sometimes, like always having to battle and always having to overthink things and such. And when you see other women just doing it. And I really struggled that, especially with, like, grocery shopping. I've mentioned before that that is one of the hardest things for me is grocery shopping. But I would compare myself to other women or, like, you know, doing chores around the house, like executive functioning. Other women can do this. They can work and do chores around the house and do all this stuff. So why can't I? And so I can really relate to that. And I would, before I got my diagnosis and you know, went through therapy and such, like, I would always compare myself to other women and be like, well, if they can do this, why can't I? Um, and so I can really relate to that and wanting, you know, to, and trying to force yourself to just do it because other women can, um, essentially is what it boils down to. And then the next one is page 281 and she's still kind of struggling with that. And so over the last week, you know, she's kind of, went through everything she associates with her disorder. So sensitivity to sound, smell, texture, 
her need for routine, her awkwardness in social situations, and her tendency towards obsession. Um, and so she's kind of tackled all those and made some changes and such. But there's two that she was still struggling with. And it says, but she couldn't suddenly talk to people with ease. And she couldn't not be obsessed with something she loved. Um, so again, it just kind of goes back to trying to suppress yourself and make yourself into something you're not. Um, and, you know, just let yourself suffer because of that. So, and though now she's kind of coming to the realize and she could change her actions, change her appearance, she, but she couldn't change the root of herself. At a core, she would always be autistic. People called it a disorder, but it didn't feel like one. To her, it was simply the way she was. And that kind of goes back to, like, there's kind of this debate in the autistic community, identity first language versus person first language. And in general, the community prefers identity first language. Which, that's not the case for everybody, obviously. We don't speak for everybody in the community. But it's the general consensus. And it is because it does play a part on who we are as as a whole person. Um, that it's kind of hard to separate the disorder from our personalities and such. So, and let's see. We're almost to the end here. I know this video is getting longer. Um, and so this one I just thought was funny. So she powered off her computer and headed for the door, snatching Karate Bear on the way out. She didn't want him, but the thought of him sitting alone in her office all night made her heartbreakingly sad. <laughs> and so we're very kind of logic, but again, just interacting with other women, uh, other autistic women, I've learned, you know, I'm the same way. Like, we attribute emotions and feelings to inanimate objects. And I'm definitely that way. And I do the same thing with my stuffed animals and my books too. Like, I, I think like they they have feelings and I, I don't want them to feel bad or whatever. Even though logically I know that. And it's kind of like funny because we are generally speaking very logical people. But then we do things like that. <laughs> um, and so I just wanted to share that one because I've definitely been there. And let's see, and the next one, you know, is, is kind of cute, but her and Michael are kind of back together, and he's warning her, like, three months in advance that he's going to ask her to marry him, which I just found funny. My husband and I, you know, talked about marriage long before, like, it wasn't a surprise for me, and I don't think I could have enjoyed it if it was a surprise. So, just, you know, something, like, we don't like surprises, like, we want to know what's happening, and where things are going and everything. And then I did mark the author's note. So again, I don't speak, you know, obviously for the whole community, but as a whole, functioning labels are not okay. And we don't like the term Asperger's anymore, the diagnosis Asperger's. It's actually not part of the DSM-5 anymore. Um, it's all under the autism spectrum disorder. But for, right off the bat, she said, the first time I heard of high-functioning autism, previously known as Asperger's syndrome, was a private discussion with my daughter's preschool teacher. Um, and yeah, I just wanted to point that out because functioning labels are damaging. They don't give enough credit to autistic people who may be considered low functioning and they don't give enough credit to the struggles of the people who might be considered high functioning. You don't see us at our low points. So we prefer like support needs. Like, yes, some people have higher support needs on a daily basis um, where other people might have lower support needs on a daily basis, but in specific situations you know, obviously that would change. And so we really don't like functioning labels because they are damaging. Um, and obviously there's a big issue with Asperger's because of Hans Asperger's and kind of the, the genocide and such that went on of children. So I'm not going to get too much into it here. But then we have the discussion questions. Um, and the one, you know, the first question is, prior to reading this book, how would you have met imagine an autistic woman um and then how does Stella compare to this vision and so I would love for you to kind of answer that in the questions if you haven't read this book just how would you 
imagine an autistic woman. Like, what do you think autism looks like? Even though there's no looks. Um, you know, I would love for you to answer that. And definitely let me know your thoughts. Because there is no one look. And everybody is so different. And it presents differently in women than it does in men. And most people do look at the stereotypical what it looks like, you know, in young boys and men versus, you know, what it could be in women. And also, I think a lot of people look at stereotypes. Autism also have, ha, often has comorbid, cor, comorbid conditions. Um, and autism is not an intellectual issue, which a lot of people, I think, confuse that with it. And so they look at the stereotype, which often has comorbid intellectual disorders um and so maybe nonverbal or things like that um and so yeah let me know your thoughts like what do you think how do you think autism presents especially in women uh and then you know it has some other you know things regarding the like actual book itself which we're not gonna go to the other question I want you guys to ponder and answer in the comments is with regards to autism people are divided between using person first language i.e. person with autism and identity first language i.e. autistic person one of the main arguments for our person first language is it separates a person from their mental disorders Many autistic people, on the other hand, prefer identity first language because they believe autism is an intrinsic part of who they are and have no wish for a cure. What do you think is right? Do you think it can depend on a person's individual circumstances and preferences? Um, and I'm just going to leave it there. It has further questions, but I'm going to leave it there. So, uh, But yeah, the other questions are more related to the book which is fun, but those two are specifically autism related. So I would love to get your thoughts in the comments below. This video is a long one, so I'm going to go ahead and leave you here. I'm definitely planning on getting her other two books, although I know the next one, um, I forget what which one comes first. You have The Bright Test, which I think is the next one, and then you have The Heart Principle, I believe. But The Bright Test follows Kai, so it's from a male um autistic view and so I'm definitely going to try to read it but I might not connect to him quite as much but I'll go ahead and leave you guys here again leave your thoughts down in the comments below and yeah happy reading everyone bye